welcome back to another video. The first of a short series of videos about the work that James Bridley, Brindley did here in the Irwell Valley, particularly at Wet Earth Colliery. Now, what he did to solve the problems at the colliery were nothing short of an engineering masterpiece. But before I start to show you what he did and the solutions to the problems he encountered, I need to give you a short backstory. So just while I give you that backstory, I'm going to be walking upstream up the River Irwell to a weir where James Brindley harnessed the power of water to solve the problems down at the colliery. Let's go and I'll tell you the story. So where are we this week? Well, we're here. We're in Salford. Uh, we're just to the west of Manchester city centre. You'll see there. We're in a place called Clifton. We're actually in the Irwell Valley, the Irwell being the River Irwell. And if I just pull the map in further, the Irwell Valley uh, is very, has got a rich history of coal mining. Unfortunately, there's not much coal mining happens here anymore, but in the past there was uh, many, many pits dotted around. Now, I want you to familiarise yourself with that locality. You'll see the little lake there just to the right of the, uh, the map. Um, and you'll see that the River Irwell just meanders around the lake. We're going to walk to the top of the screen there um, on the River Irwell to a weir. Like I say, rich history of mining in this area. And we're concerned with one particular mine, the Wet Earth Colliery, otherwise known as Clifton Colliery. So this is the Irwell Valley and it sort of runs to the west of Manchester city centre. And obviously it's the valley in which the River Irwell flows. There's a massive fault in the rock and that what that fault's done, as far as I'm aware, has pushed up coal seams. And for hundreds of years, people were aware of the coal, this precious resource, and they dug it out from the surface. Because as I say, some, in some places you can see it as grey shales. So people dug down, cleaned it up and burned it on fires. Some of the early pits around here, because there's a long, long history of mining in the Irwell Valley, some of the early pits were just ladder shafts. Basically, they sunk a shaft, stuck a ladder down it, got to the coal seam and just took out what they could. Very inefficient, very dangerous way of mining. Even more dangerous were some of the old bell pits where they sunk a shaft and then they started to work outwards like that. And when it was at the point of collapse, they realised then they had to give up and they had to get out. Uh, so that was bell pit mining, extremely dangerous. Now, there was a landowner called John Heathcote and he owned land round here and he sank a considerable amount of money into a pit down here, a colliery called Wet Earth Colliery. It was a simple shaft, but he knew he was sitting on a bit of a gold mine. So what sort of year are we talking here? So it's about 1740s, late 1740s, when Heathcote's pit at Wet Earth Colliery was beset with these problems of water. As was all mining, most mining you'll find is beset with the problems of water ingress. Um, what was the water? Well, it was surface water that was finding its way down through cracks and fissures in the rock. And also, <clears throat> the River Irwell. The River Irwell itself. I can get down here without breaking my neck. The River Irwell itself actually found a way through the, um, the Irwell Valley Fault and all the associated cracks in the rock with it and went into the, uh, the pit. So they, like I say, they were beset with these problems of flooding. I've read a book at the moment and what they're saying is about 60 gallons a minute. Now apparently that's not a lot, but I don't know anything about water ingress in mines, but 60 gallons a minute. And they were trying it with buckets, <clears throat> pulling uh, the water up with buckets and, and a horse gin. So let me show you the sort of arrangement they had, the primitive arrangement they had at the gold pit back in the early days. They had this pit pony that was attached to a horse gin and it just went round and round and round and it operated a winch mechanism and they were bringing the water up with buckets. Completely and utterly inadequate considering the supposed sort of red 60 gallons a minute that were pouring into the pit and that isn't a lot for a, a, a pit working apparently. They even tried buckets, sort of like multiple buckets on a, on a rope so there was like you know one bucket after the other and this is before they can even bring the coal out. So Heathcote is at a loss 
He knows he's sat on a fortune. He knows there's coal there. He knows he can make money. And let's not deny that the prime motivator for all this work that went on subsequently was to make money, to get coal out of the ground and make money. So Heathcote calls on, he knows of a local family in the area called the Fletchers and they've got mines over in Bolton and they're quite doing quite well. So he calls on Matthew Fletcher, one of the sons of the mine owners around there, who's quite well known as an engineer, quite a clever lad. Now he was only 18, 19 Matthew Fletcher, but he brought him in as a kind of consultant and said, what can I do here? How can I get rid of the water from my mine to get to the coal? Well, Matthew Fletcher, even though he was a clever lad, he couldn't solve the problem either. So now we're about 1750 and Heathcote decides to shut down Wet Earth Colliery, not because he's give up, but because they can't cope anymore with this water. It's completely inefficient and he needs to come up with a solution. So what does Heathcote do? He'd heard of an engineer called James Brinley. Now there's a few rumours that they met at a wedding. Um, I'm not quite sure about that, but he heard of this engineer that was getting a bit of a reputation for himself. Like I say, James Brinley. So he brings Brinley in and says to him, can you solve the problem of water ingress at my mine? And that is where the engineering story begins. It's now 1750. Brinley does a survey of this land. It takes him two years till 1752. And his solution is to build a weir. Now the weir was only the first part of the solution. I'm going to try and get a closer look at the weir for you now. But the weir was the first part of the solution. This water's got a lot higher recently. Let's see if I can not get wet feet. Now this isn't the original weir, this was built later, as you can see it's concrete, um, but Brindley's weir was here. This concrete modernised structure was built about 1924 and it was, the reason it was built was because over that side they built Kersley power station and they utilised the head of water to cool the, uh, for the cooling for the power station. Well that's a side story. If you look on the far side, you can see some of the stone and that is from Brindley's original construction. I'm also wondering if this stone here is from Brindley's original construction. It must have been a hell of a thing to build. If you look at the flow now of the River Irwell, what a thing to build. Well, basically what Brindley wanted was a head of water, right? A normally shallow, fast flowing river. He wanted a head of water, a big pool of water and he could take a flow off that then from behind the weir and send it on its way to the colliery to give the colliery water power. Ah, probably the worst day we could have filmed this video, it's throwing it down and the water's really high but it does demonstrate the river Irwell and how powerful it can be and the resource that it can be. So here we are at the weir, Ringley Weir. Obviously it never used to look like this, it was stone, it was Brindley's original 1700 weir. Um, like I say, this is a later construction, about 1924. Well there, you ought to come forward. There's Brindley's head of water, that's what he needed. He needed a vast source of water. The River Irwell normally is quite shallow and fast flowing, and that's no good to anyone. He needed this big head of water, 
And if you look down there, you see the wall there with the bits of ironwork on the side? That is where he took a flow of water off, off the head and took it to do its bidding. Let's go down there and see if we can get a closer look at those sluice gates and the entrance to Brindley's tunnel. Now, just before we do that, let me give you an overview of what's going on here. You'll see at the top, we've got Ringley Weir, and I'm about to show you the sluice gates on the side. Those will take the water into a tunnel represented by the red dotted line. So James Brindley dug a tunnel and it went roughly in the direction of the dotted line. Now it was a bit more, it meandered a bit more than that because he kept it in different types of rock and he had to stick to the rock that they could actually dig through. In some parts that tunnel was unlined and in some parts it was brick lined. He takes the water to the river bank. You'll see where it says siphon downcast. The river Irwell has now meandered round and we've come to the river bank. He takes it underneath the river, and I'll address that in more detail later, and he brings it back up on the opposite river bank where it says siphon upcast. It then runs along in an open stream, what they call the feeder stream, and it runs down where it makes a sharp turn left to the bottom of the picture, and it will go into the colliery where it will drive a water wheel. And that is the purpose of all this. Now, something I just need to address on the map, on the picture for you, you'll see it says Clifton Marina. That's much later. Clifton Marina was dug out in the 1960s when they were building a nearby motorway, the M60 motorway. They used a, they dug out a big gravel pit. They later decided that they would fill the gravel pit with water and make the whole area um, uh, a nature reserve. So at the back in the 1700s, 1752, Clifton Marina wasn't there. The whole area was farmland and little collieries dotted around. But that's an overview of what James Brindley is trying to achieve. Right, so let's see if we can see this, this sluice inlet um, where Brindley took the water down into the tunnel. There's not a lot to see, but I'll see if we can get you a shot. If there's any uh, rain on the lens, I'm sorry about that, but it's throwing it down. Uh, need to be careful. I've checked this, it's solid. Right, so what I'm looking at here, you'll see the uh, you'll see the sluice mechanism. I'll get Danny to pass me the camera in a minute. You'll see the sluice mechanism, and down below was where the the inlet was. If, do you want to pass me the camera, Danny? Yes. Okay, so we're right on the edge of the river here, but uh, you see that? See the sluices? Sluice gates. Uh, and you see down below there, that's the entrance down there to the tunnel. See another sluice mechanism there. I'll zoom in. So down there, if we could dig down there, you'd get into the intake. And obviously this was operated from above, up here, up there. Let's see if we can get out now. Now you're probably wondering why that looks modern because it's not obviously 1700s. It's brick and it's got a concrete top on it. Concrete top there. For a while this still fed Fletcher's Canal which is down um, further down the valley. We'll come to Fletcher's Canal. Let's go and see now where the tunnel, Brindley's tunnel that took the head of water now this way where it ran because it goes now back towards the River Irwell. Hopefully at this point I've explained to you with maps and with overlays and things like that. So let's head on down the road now. We're going now towards Wet Earth Colliery and we're following the course of the water 
from the weir head to where it's going to carry out its function. Now, just before we do follow the tunnel or the route of the tunnel, I'm just I'm not holding anything back this week. This is quite a complex thing that Brindley did, and I want to give you the whole thing without holding anything back. You'll see we've drawn this from a book, so this is our drawing, but it's copied from a book. Um, you'll see the tunnel at the weir. There's the weir, and there's the tunnel that takes the water down to the colliery where it will drive a water wheel. They built a series of what they called washouts. I like to think of it as an overflow, but they built a washout. And you'll see the washout just comes out there off the main tunnel, just below the weir. Right, so we were very interested in that and we wanted to find it, and I think we did. Take a look at this. The weir is behind you, we're just a short way down, and I think here was one of the washouts. Uh, if you come and look at this, if you look at that there, and you look at the construction, look how the stone comes in here, and you've got stone here, and some sort of construction there. I think behind there is the overflow for the uh, initial feeder stream. So the feeder stream went off way over that way, but he put this washout in here to wash back into the river. This here, I think is the washout, the overflow, definitely needs it's obviously silted up or it's collapsed possible further investigation there don't you think so just quickly there's a few things i want to address firstly the time scales involved um 1750 when heathcote closed the colliery due to water problems that's 270 years ago Quite often in my videos, we'll talk about Victorian engineering and how wonderful the Victorian engineers were. This work predates that by many, many years. I looked up who was on the throne in um, 1750, and it was George II, one of the kings of the House of Hanover. And I always think of it as the, the kings with the curly wigs and the tights. That's how far back we're going, we're going back. It's bad enough trying to get your head around 100 years, but 270 years is a phenomenal amount of time. So to recap, 1750 the colliery is closed due to water problems. Brindley's brought in, he takes two years to do a survey of the area. After two years, he comes up with his plan. Now, when I'm talking, I'll say Brindley did this and Brindley built this and Brindley did the other. James Brindley, and not to um, knock anything that he did at all, James Brindley was the mastermind of all this but he was a consultant. So he came in, drew up the plans, and the day-to-day -day overseeing of the work involved was done by our friend, Matthew Fletcher. Do you remember the young lad that was brought in from the local family? So Matthew Fletcher, being the clever lad that he was, oversaw the day-to-day -day, uh, work that was going on, all the tunneling and everything. Brindley would come and stay occasionally and stay in a cottage in the area, inspect what was going on and give new direction. Now, after the two-year survey, work commenced in 1752, and it took four years till 1756 for the water to finally get from the weir and do its job down at the colliery, turning the water wheel, and it all worked very successfully. The literature I'm reading says that it estimates that the work could have been done faster than four years, <clears throat> and it's very scant because a lot of the abandonment plans for the colliery were lost and some of those abandonment plans may have had some of the original plans for the building of the whole uh, scheme. So we've got scant, scant evidence to go off. It's said that there was a handful of men that did the work. Now a handful of men to do this tunnelling, does that mean five, ten? I would have thought maybe 30 or 50 men probably to do the work, although I'm guessing, but it does say a handful of men to dig the tunnels and to get the water to where it was needed to be. They've also looked into what happened to all the spoil from the tunneling work and nowhere in the area can they find a spoil uh, tip. So it was, it was thought that the spoil was immediately taken away to build roads in the area. Now, when I say roads, it would have probably been to shore up the tracks in the area. There would have been just cart tracks around because remember, it was very rural. The collieries were very primitive. 
This was almost 300 years ago. And of course, that was one of the problems of getting the coal to where it needed to be. Um, big problems, loading it onto carts, taking it along rough tracks to where it needed to be, probably in Manchester and in Salford. Later, when the canals came, it solved that problem. So, spoil seemed to have gone and fixed the local roads and the tracks. Now, as we look at the, the plan that I've shown you of the route of the tunnel, you're probably thinking, that's very complicated and it probably took a lot of work. Why could you not just come up with a more simple solution? Well, I'm going to show you uh, the simple solution that was considered on this map now. Okay, so here's our map again of the area and we'll look at the blue line. So why didn't James Brindley just do that? Take the water flow to the left of the weir and run it in an open channel down towards the colliery. Well, that was considered, but it was objected to by the landowners in the area. They didn't want an open stream running through their land. How would the animals get from one side to the other? And what would happen if it flooded? So there was strong, strong objection to this. Um, also, they were concerned at the time that it could be sabotaged, that... Um, you know, if the landowners really didn't like this, they could divert the water for their own use and they could basically sabotage it and cut off the water supply to the colliery. So again, why didn't Brindley follow this much shorter route from the uh, White Arrow? Why did they not take that route down to the colliery? Well, again, same same issues with landowners objecting to an open stream in the area and, they didn't, and Brindley didn't want an open stream. And also at that point, the river now was sunken down into a, a little gorge, if you like. It's not a, a very deep gorge, but it's gone down into a mini valley. Up at Ringley Weir, the land is much higher um, than Wet Earth Colliery and you get that downward flow of water. The route at the uh, White Arrow, again, the river's too low now. So that's why that much more simple and more obvious route was completely and utterly ruled out. Now, could uh, Brinley have built a dam at the Red X, which was literally almost in line at the side of Wet Earth Colliery? That was considered. But again, the literature that I'm reading, it, it, it says two things. Number one, it says that a dam in that area would have flooded massive areas of land and again the landowners would not have uh, accepted that and it's also thought that this was fairly early in Brindley's career and it's thought that a dam of such scale would be a little bit beyond him at that time and again not to knock James Brindley at all but this was fairly early in his career. Now another option considered was to build a water wheel, put the water wheel at Red X. Now where you see Red X it's quite close to the colliery but the river at that point is in its gorge and it's about 60 feet below the level of the colliery. So you would have had to taken a drive shaft off the water wheel, run it uphill which I'm sure was quite possible and run it along the land to the colliery to turn uh, the pump mechanism to pump out the, the colliery. This was ruled out because it was too complex and the drive shaft would have been prone to snapping and breaking and it was just not, uh, it was thought of but they quickly ruled that idea out. Now back to this idea of a dam and um, the, the idea of the River Irwell being ferocious in flood that we've witnessed in Manchester and Salford, we've seen this. And of course when we were filming this was February. So I want to show you just how uh, violent the river is. And obviously most rivers in flood can be like this. But we're going to nip back down now to the riverbank and I'm going to show you uh, the River Irwell's dirty work when it was in full flood flow. Just take a look at this. Incidentally, we're just here by the Irwell in February 2020 and we've just recently had some really high waters. And we came a couple of months ago to do a recce around this area. This bridge was intact. The high waters have completely wrecked this bridge. Me and Danny are just completely dumbfounded. And you can see it across there. See how it's ripped the bridge over there completely. It was a service bridge. Going back to our feeder tunnel, you will notice at the first part of the tunnel that comes from the weir, it goes underneath Bolton Wastewater Treatment Works, which is basically a sewage works.
Now that sewage works was built in the 1940s. I think, the, I think it's 1947. And before they built it, they knew that Brinley's tunnel was underneath there. Well, nonetheless, a large part of Brindley's tunnel was demolished. So they basically, I think they did a, a survey of it and then they just broke into it and demolished it for the sewage works. So the only bits of that initial part of the tunnel that exist are the little bit from the weir. And I don't know how much from the weir exists. And then just from the fence of the sewage works to um, the downcast siphon. So unfortunately, we've lost a huge part of the uh, original tunnel. So that said, we're now, we've made our way down now to where it says downcast siphon. And we're stood on the riverbank and you'll see how high I am above the river. And let me tell you about um, where we are now. So behind the fence there, that is the sewage farm. That sewage farm, as we know, cut into Brindley's feeder tunnel that has now run from the weir. Well, here we are on the riverbank and the actual, the tunnel still exists just this side of the, uh, the sewage farm and it's deep below us down here. If you come over here, I'm going to show you the riverbank. So where I'm stood now, you see we're on the, the higher side of the river, the river's down in the valley. This is where Brinley pulled his master stroke. Previously done by the, uh, the Greeks and the Romans, Brinley took the water and dropped it down a shaft 50 feet underneath the river Irwell, sent it underneath that way and brought it back up in an inverted siphon to feed a stream on the other side of the river. Brindley's inverted siphon is roughly here where I'm stood, down under the river and up on that side. That was his master stroke. That is where Brindley made water run uphill. Now we can't see nothing here, but wouldn't it be great to see the downcast feeder shaft where Brindley created his siphon? Well, if you stay tuned for part two, we're not sure, but we think we might be able to find a way to take a look at that underground siphon and see what he did. Somewhere there's a tunnel. We're going to look for that tunnel in part two and see if we can see it. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks very much for watching. Please stay tuned for part two because this just gets better and better, this story. We've yet to go down and look at the colliery. Thanks for watching. Take care. And I'll see you in the next video. If you enjoy these videos and you want to support me, please consider clicking the join button for additional content. This actually only works on PC or laptop. Thank you very much.